chapter 6, and then we'll consider its application to our lives today. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for it is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Father, we thank you for the fact that you have provided us your word. We thank you, God. It's just such a comfort. And actually, God, it's such a joy to have it in our hands and to have your teaching, your manual for life, for everything, including raising kids and including being a child in a home. And so I'm asking today that you might be glorified. I'm asking that you would change our hearts and our minds, that we might be transformed. Uh, we kind of come uh, because of the fallen nature, Lord, with some wrong ideas about parenting and about being a child in the home. And we need you to change our hearts. We need you to give us your perspective and your wisdom. And we need you to move us, God, to want to do your will and walk in obedience to the things that we read in this passage today. And I pray that the result would be every family would be stronger than when they came in. Every family would be more encouraged and built up. Every family would have a vision for uh, the role and the important vital position that their family has in the kingdom of God and even on this island and in the world. And I ask God that you would give us vision for what can be when we put our trust in you. So Holy Spirit, lead our time. Take my preparation and my words and my mouth and my mind and use them to bring glory to your name. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. I want to start off with a little story about a gentleman that was, uh, that was walking through the supermarket. He's pushing a cart, and he's got a screaming baby uh, in the cart. We've all been in situations where we've either been there or seen that. Well, as he was going through the aisles, he kept repeating softly, be calm, George. George, try to be calm. Don't get too excited. George, everything's going to be okay. George, don't yell. And a woman had kind of been following him and watching this whole thing, and she just had this kind of tender mother heart and saw this man dealing with this screaming, out-of-control child, and she was just inspired by the guy. They ended up in line, and she parked her cart right behind his and, and just kind of had the courage to, to say, excuse me, sir, and I just wanted you to know, I've been kind of watching what's been happening, and I know your child is really having a hard time, but I, I just want to commend you for your patience in working with, with little George. And he said, lady... My name is George. <laughs> uh, if you've ever been in a situation like that, it's just one of those moments, among many moments in, in the parenting process, that's painful, it's difficult, it's embarrassing, uh, sometimes it's overwhelming. Uh, there are times you want to quit, there, you want to give up, you invest, you invest, you invest, and finally, sometimes it just doesn't turn out how you want it to with your children. They make bad decisions, and... Uh, don't respond to your leadership, and sometimes you just, it's like, I, I just could, wish I could have skipped that whole step, you know, of having kids. And then there's another component of this on the other side, which is the children who sometimes are in homes where the parents don't really have a very biblical worldview on how to parent, and, uh, and the kids struggle under the weight of that leadership. And, and sometimes the children, and we've been there too when we were kids, where I just, I wish I'd been born in a different family. Or I wish I lived in a different place, or I wish those were my parents. And, uh, and we get people, Hanias, you know. Uh, Hanias adopt if you're not from the island. And we, we spend more time sometimes at, at our friend's house because we feel safer or more loved or more encouraged or whatever there than we do in our own home. And so you've got this dynamic of this, this thing that's called family that the Bible says is a gift from God, but it turns out being sometimes a real challenge and sometimes a real difficult uh, arduous journey that is almost more than we can take on both ends of the spectrum. And what I want to share with you is that God's got a plan for family, and it's a plan for good. It's a blessing. Although we don't have him saying good in the, in the first uh, six days of creation, God created family, and it is good, and his plan is good. It's our sin and our misunderstanding of family that makes it so painful. Sin ruins everything. I, and I was talking about this the other day with a couple of friends, and I was just commenting that, you know, I can hardly wait to, for the king to come. I don't know how you feel, but I'm like, I'm like, come on, come on, you know? It's like, I want to go home. I, I mean, I totally love life. I love my family. I love ministry. I mean, I'm more invigorated and more excited 
about what God is doing than I've ever been in my life. But it, 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 it holds a dim light to compare with that of the kingdom of heaven that's coming. And I find myself just wanting him to come. Um, and it, part of it is because sin is just rampant. And I'm dealing all the time, especially as a pastor, with people that are, are sinned against or sinning against someone else. Uh, and the consequences in a marriage or in a family uh, with kids that have been abused and molested and harmed and hurt. You know, we're dealing with people with finances that cheat and steal. And it's just, it's just everywhere. And I was thinking to myself, what in the world am I going to do when I get to heaven? Everything I have to do with is encouraging people to walk away from sin and walk toward God and be stable in their relationship with their spouse and their wife. I mean, I'm constantly having to help people move away from sin and toward God. That's, that's pretty much what I do 24-7. And I'm thinking, what in the world am I going to do when I get to heaven? Oh, I've only got training for this, you know? That's what I do. And, uh, but I, I, I know God's got more for me in the kingdom of heaven. But the problem that we have in our families, and our marriage, whatever relationship we have, it's always sin that, that cripples it and ruins it and taints it and damages it. And the, the wonderful thing about the book of Ephesians is that God has mapped out for us in the first three chapters the glorious giftings he's given to the church and the way he's transformed us and the new life that we have in us. And then he talks about the word of God and then he talks about the spirit of God who lives in us, enabling us to live this new life. And he gives us instructions on the fact that we're going we're to receive an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. And, and he tells us that we have this new relationship with God and a new relationship with the church and a new relationship with our spouse. And now he's talking about this new relationship in our family. And in the midst of all of that, he says that you, as believers, in your spiritual life, in your married life, in your life with your children, and next week we're going to talk about life in the in business community, in your vocation, in all these things, you have become now a fragrant aroma of Christ, and now you are an expression of the manifold wisdom of God to the heavens and everyone there and to the earth and everyone here. And God gives you this platform because of your belief in Christ to be an ambassador in his name by virtue of everything that you touch, everything that you're involved in, everything that you are. And so I want to inspire you today, I hope, to see your family as, as not a vehicle for having some legacy and not just as a vehicle for doing what you're supposed to do, which is to procreate, have kids, buy a house, buy a car, you know, buy some toys and somehow find meaning in that. But I want to inspire you to realize that your family is the very foundation of your capacity to express the manifold wisdom of God as you become increasingly successful at being married, at being a parent, at being a child, whatever your role is in the family life, God has got a plan for you that in that relationship and in the context of that, you would be sharers in his divine nature. But it is not an overnight process. And as I go through the text of the scripture and, and uh, give this teaching this morning, I want to encourage you because I know some of you are right in the middle of a battle. And, uh, and it's not going well. And it might be with your marriage. It might be with your children. It might be with your parents. Even as adults, there's a, there's a challenge there at times. And... I want to encourage you that wherever you are, God is redemptive. That's his whole MO, is that he takes broken things and he fixes them. He takes broken people and he restores them. He takes broken families and, and, and he brings life to them, if we're willing. But we have to do with our family what we had to do with ourselves, is we have to come and say, it's not much, it's broken, it's kind of a mess. I don't know if you can do anything with it, but God, I'm surrendering all to you. And I'm saying, you're in charge, you're the Lord, you're the king, and I'll do it your way. Have your way. Magnify your name. Somehow glorify your person through my family. Well, so we're going to consider the family today. And uh, unfortunately, uh, many Christians abdicate this role of leadership in their home, especially men. We're the leaders. We've talked about that over the last couple of weeks, is that God has vested the, the husband and the father with the particular responsibility of leadership in the home. It's a partnership with the, the husband and wife, but the husband is the, is the one that's called by God in the chain of command to express leadership that's under the authority of Jesus Christ. And so, um, unfortunately, 
there's something in men, uh, and I can speak to that because I'm a man and I'm a, I'm a husband and I'm a father, but there's something in us that wants to find significance outside of the family. Um, I think that's part of the fallen nature, quite frankly, uh, because we're looking for something besides what God has actually established for us to have our greatest sense of significance and nobility and strength and dignity and a sense of, of significance in life. I believe with all my heart that it was meant to be primarily experienced in the marriage relationship and in the family, and then only secondarily beyond that in our vocation. But we've been duped by the enemy and by our own fallen flesh to ab abdicate that primary responsibility and then go find significance somewhere else. And it never, ever, ever, ever works. At best, it's a temporary uh, uh, rush of some sort of uh, success or acknowledgement. But at the end of the day, these things outside of the marriage and the family that God has given us in relationship with Christ are, are at best uh, second class to this first relationship of God and our families. I, I like what Socrates said, um, of course, a philosopher. He said, could I climb the highest places in Athens? I would lift up my voice and proclaim, fellow citizens, why do you turn and scrape every stone to gather wealth and take so little care of the children to whom you must someday relinquish it all? It's a good question. Why are we spending so much time outside the home trying to achieve and accomplish and amass and gather when, when we're going to pass it off to the kids we don't even necessarily get along with? We don't even like them sometimes. And sometimes they don't like us. And we don't invest very much in that relationship that we end up having to pass everything off to them in the end. It's a very good question. Howard Hendricks, uh, who is a great uh, preacher, has said that uh, uh, in research, the average child spends about 1% of their time in church, 16% of their time at school, and 83% of their time at home. And his point is, is that the place where a, a child and a, and a parent relationship is going to be most clearly evidenced and built is going to be in the home. And so we have an obligation. You can't pawn this off on the church. You can't pawn it off on the schools. First of all, they don't have enough time with your child. But secondly, it's not their responsibility, ultimately. It's the responsibility of the parent. So it's a dance. It's kind of like the husband-wife relationship. They're mutual responsibilities. It's a dance with child-rearing as well. Uh, the child has a responsibility and the parents have a responsibility. And the scripture lays that out. And so we're going to go through this very, fairly quickly today and uh, talk about first the duty of children. And so if you're younger, I should be preaching over there right now. Uh, to the Sunday school classes, but uh, you can pass this on to them. But this also applies for even us who are adults and, uh, and or, or, you know, in our teenage years, college years. There's still this sense that we can still apply many of these truths as it relates to our parents, even for those of us that are adults, 40, 50, 60 years old. We still have parents and many of them are still alive. So what's the proper attitude toward parents? Well, the Bible is very clear in Leviticus 19. It says that each one of you must respect his mother and father. That is the command of God. And so our parents are to be obeyed. In fact, in the book of Colossians 3.20, it says that we are to obey our parents in everything. Now, I have to make a, a little exception here. If you're an adult and you don't live in your home, uh, th this is a different category. We're talking about children under the roof of their parents' home. But I still think that there's a principle here that when possible and when, when it's reasonable and when it's biblical, we should do our best to be responsive even to our adult parents uh, in honor of them. But this is primarily for those that are still uh, living within their parents' home. Uh, I maybe have to make a caveat there too because we got people that are 30, 40 years old still living at home. But I'm talking about those that are under the age of 18. And also the Bible says that they're to be honored. In fact, in, uh, in Exodus 20, it's the fifth commandment that God gives. And he says, honor your father and mother. And as the text in the scripture says here in Ephesians, it's the first commandment that comes with a promise. And we'll talk about that promise in a few moments. And so as children, our, our offspring are to be obedient and to honor our, their parents. And for those of us that are uh, still in the home or still under our parents' leadership, our command from God is to obey and to honor our parents. Now, what's the motivation? Well, the motivation is, number one, it's just simply commanded by God. That's as simple as it gets. Remember, we're talking in the book of Ephesians about this renewed and transformed life. 
So part of that renewal means that our relationships on every level are transformed and changed. We're not of the darkness anymore. We're walking in the light. We're not of the enemy's camp anymore. We're a part of the camp and the citizenry of the kingdom of God. Satan is no longer our king. Jesus Christ is our king. And the realm that we live in right now is this temporal realm of this world, but in the end, we're going to be a part of a new realm and a new kingdom. And so in essence, God plants us on the earth and he says, I want you to be a representative of my kingdom, my citizenry, and my reign here on earth so that people can know what my reign and my rule over men and women in my love and compassion and kindness and grace, what it looks like, and so that it will be inviting and attractive for them to be a part of the same life. And so the kids in our, in our families, either ourselves or our own children, one of the things that God has given you to be able to be an expression of the manifold wisdom of God is how you conduct yourselves with your parents. And everything in our culture says resist, fight, you know, uh, disobey, cut corners, uh, cheat, steal, lie, don't tell your parents everything. This is the culture we live in. This is what TV constantly is teaching all of us. And it's contrary to the purposes of God. And so the reason that we need to respect our parents is because, first of all, our king of this new kingdom and this new citizenry commands it. The second thing is that in Colossians 3, it says we need to do it because it pleases the Lord. If we're truly born-again Christians, one of our premier desires is the honoring and pleasure of God. And one of the things that God says that we can do that and how we can express that is simply by being responsive to the leadership of our parents. The third thing is it's simply the right thing to do. We have a good model of that in Jesus Christ as a young boy when he went down to Nazareth with his family. And the Bible says that he was obedient to them. And he grew in favor with God and man, in stature and in favor with God and man. So everyone around Jesus saw this responsive young man to his parents. And I don't know if you've ever been around a family where the, where the kids are just really well-behaved. And they're, you know, let's say they're toddlers and and the parents really seem, they're not perfect. The kids get a little wild. They have fun. They fight sometimes. But in the overall scheme of things, you get the sense that the parents really are loving and the kids are respectful and they know the boundaries and the limits and there's, there's peace in the home. That's an amazing experience to see. And it really honors God. Whenever you see that, it's like, wow, that's kind of amazing, especially in the day and age in which we live. And it's just the right thing to do. Now, um, I'm not sharing this because I'm trying to frighten any of you that are kids uh, or living in your parents' home, but I'm telling you it's really scary what the Bible says when you choose not to obey your parents. So keep in mind, this isn't my stuff. This is Bible. This is right out of the Bible. Here are the dangers of, re of disrespecting your parents. You really don't want to go here. And uh, so this is really, this is bad stuff. I'm warning you right in advance here, okay? This is really bad. Okay, you're going to be cursed. Wow. I mean, you know, we're not talking about some, you know, you know, some nonsense down in Kapa'a with somebody putting, you know, pins in a, in a doll. We're talking about God cursing your life when you fail to honor your parents. This is what it says, Deuteronomy 27, 16. Cursed is the man who dishonors his father and his mother. Oh, it gets worse. Well, you've got your notes. Your eyes will be pecked out. Wow. You know, Bad. Proverbs 30, the eyes that mock a father and scorns obedience to his mother will be pecked out by the ravens of the valley and will be eaten by the vultures. Yum, yum. <laughs> Bible also says that that person is worthy of death. I won't read this whole text in Deuteronomy 21, but it says that if a child is rebellious and unresponsive to their parents in the Old Testament, uh, the parents were supposed to bring that child to the, to the elders at the city gate uh, they were to have a little court hearing, and if it was discovered to be true, uh, the whole community would, would kill that child, would stone that child. I, I'm not advocating that, by the way. I know some of you are thinking, oh, can I? And I, no, the answer is no. No. But in the Old Testament, that was how they dealt. It says they, they, that the evil was to be purged from among you, and all Israel would hear of it and be afraid. In other words, there was a, there was a deterrence to that kind of behavior. And the truth is, is that we don't have any of that deterrence in our culture now. I mean, kids act however they want, and it's just like you, they can call CPS. 
If you, if you spank them, if you, you know, do anything, it's like, you know, I'm going to call the police. It's like, you know, that's the culture that we live in. Don't any of you do that uh, that are younger? I, it's just, uh, it's, it's one of those things that could happen but shouldn't. So, uh, <laughs> the other thing is, is that it says your lamp will be snuffed out. Um, if a man curses his father and mother, his lamp will be snuffed out as in pitch darkness. These are bad things. I think those are all bad, right? Cursed, pecked out, uh, death. Snuffed out. Yeah, I think that's the bad list. Let's get to the good list. Because really what we want to do is that we want to do things not just because of fear, but we want to do things because of the favor of God and the blessing of God. And what he says the benefits are is that you will, have, uh, you will give your parents joy. Uh, a wise son brings joy to his father. The second thing is that you're going to have actually a better life because in Deuteronomy 4, it says that if we keep these commands and decrees, that it says that it will go well with you and your children after you. And so when we actually respond well to our parents, we are actually investing in our children's future. Isn't that crazy? When we as people under the leadership of our parents respond and appropriately uh, react to their leadership in our lives, it all, not only blesses our life, but it is, God says, I'm going to bless your children's life after you by virtue of your obedience to your parents. It also says that we'll be protected from danger. Um, you know, it talks about the fact that these commands are a lamp, this teaching is a light, and the correction of discipline are the way of life, keeping you from the immoral woman and from the smooth tongue of the wayward wife. This is from Proverbs 6. And so all this teaching comes through the parents. That's where it's supposed to come from. And as the teaching comes through the parents, the children are protected by that wisdom and insight that they receive in terms of the instruction or by means of the instruction of the parents. The fourth thing is the Bible says in Proverbs 3 is that you will enjoy a long life. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands. This is Solomon talking to his sons. Keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Isn't that amazing? The Bible actually promises prosperity to children who honor and respect their parents. And the last thing, which we already have talked about, is that simply pleasing to the Lord. You know, it makes me kind of wonder how this cycle just keeps going and going and going. And, and a lot of times it's, it's presented, and I think maybe partly accurately, as the parent's responsibility how their children act and behave. But in the text of Scripture, it gives clear instruction to the child and says the child has a responsibility before God to behave in a way that's honoring and respectful of their parents. I'm going to get to the parents' part. But it's interesting that, that I, it makes me wonder as I'm speaking here how many people's lives have turned into disasters of, of one terrible decision after another with terrible consequences simply because they have a bad, unreconciled relationship with their parents. One of the things I'm going to suggest to us, uh, all of us, because of course we all have parents, is that we give consideration to maybe taking a look inside and seeing if there's anything that we've done and not reconciled with our parents? Is there some, some disrespect of the past, some violation, some offense, some lie, some dishonoring that we were a part of? And it makes me wonder, based on the scriptures here, if it wouldn't be a blessing to us to be free ourselves, but also bless our parents by acknowledging those things. And then thirdly, enter into a potential new blessing from God just by virtue of the fact that God blesses us when we honor and respect our parents. So I'm encouraging you to give that thought and to consider that God may have more for you, more blessing, more favor, more prosperity, if you simply will go back, even as an adult, and make pono on those things that you maybe have left undone with your family. But now we go to the duties of fathers in, uh, in verse 4. And in the case of husbands and wives, not all the obligation lies just on one side, as I said. So now we have the obligation of the parents, and in particular, the father. And we're told, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Um, provoke means to exasperate or to irritate or annoy to the point of anger. In the New English Bible, it says, you must not goad your children to a place of resentment. Colossians 3.21 says, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. There's a variety of things that a dad can do in particular to discourage his children. 
And, um, you know, if you're an adult, all you probably have to do is to think about what discouraged you as a child. Um, I don't think any of us had perfect dads. Uh, most of us had dads that we respect in some ways and, and would have wished that were a little different in other ways. But there are things that our dads did to us, both men and women here, that really had an impact on us that caused resentment. And so really the thing I can just tell you is that if you want to learn how not to be this kind of a person, just think about not doing what hurt you. And if you just simply don't do those things, you'll probably be in a good position to do the right things. But I've got some things here that I, that I think in general are good examples of what really brings resentment to the heart of a child and causes them to close off and causes them to submarine and causes them to shut you out and causes them to rebel and causes them to resent and to be bitter and angry and unresponsive and disrespectful and dishonoring to a parent's leadership. One of those is mocking and imitating your child in a negative way. I see this happening. I see moms and dads doing it somehow thinking that they're going to get their kid to behave by mocking them and behaving in the same way and acting the same way as a child is acting to give it right back to them the same medicine, so to speak. And it can be very damaging. Tormenting or humiliate, humiliating your child can be really damaging. Um, and I, I, remember, I remember even friends, family friends coming over and you know, doing things that were just like, you get to the point where you're, you get angry. Like, I'd get tickled so long. You, anybody ever have that happen where your parents would tickle you? Or, you know, you get tickled and you got to the point that you really just wanted to kill, but you couldn't because you're too small. And uh, so sometimes just tormenting uh, and, and doing things that, that drive your child to the point of anger or frustration, those are the things you definitely want to avoid. You don't want to humiliate your child either. I've seen parents try to get their children to walk in obedience to them by publicly embarrassing them in front of other people and their friends. And, and of course, that's not a biblical approach. Being harsh or scolding in an ungodly way is, is really damaging. Being hypocritical or unreasonable. I'm telling you, if, if, uh, especially men, if we teach our children something and live the opposite way, it completely devastates our standing with our children. Uh, you know, I was just, uh, I was thinking about um, dogs the other day. And I'm probably going to be really sorry I even went this direction because I wasn't planning on it. You can probably tell us I'm thinking here, should I tell this? Should I talk about this? Okay, I'm going to talk about dogs for a minute. Men, you know how you guys that have dogs and pets, there's something really special about a dog coming home, uh, coming home to the dog. And, and the dog's at the door, and it's wagging its tail. It's just like it's, it's completely in love with you. It just thinks you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, right? We, there's that component of having a pet. And, and, you know, hugging a dog when your day's gone bad, and the dog is the only one that really totally understands, you know, your life. Of course, the dog doesn't understand anything, but we pretend he understands everything. But there's this sense of closeness, and there's this sense of, of belonging. There's this sense of excitement coming home to this pet. And the thing I want to share with you, this has got to be the worst illustration I've ever shared and where this is going. Uh, but, but there's, I, I really want to tell, I want to say that I believe that the family unit is, is to be that thing that you're coming home to. I believe that the family, your children, not necessarily wagging their tails and panting, but, you know, uh, although we've done that with my kids before, it's like, you know, get up in the morning, it's like, I'm so excited to see you this morning, you know, to my boys. Okay, it's getting really bad, I know. Um, a little, these little uh, bizarre windows into my family life. Uh, but there's this sense of excitement that we share as a family, and I really honestly think that men in particular, but moms too, but men in particular, because that's what the text is talking about, I believe that when you come home, one of the gifts that God has prepared for you is a family that has been waiting and looking forward to your arrival. But a lot of men don't experience that. And part of the reason is that if we're living a life that isn't admirable, if we're living a life that's hypocritical, if we're living a life that is duplicitous and contrary to the Word of God, and if we embarrass or humiliate our kids or mock them, or if we're physically or verbally abusive to them, of course they're not going to be at the door. Your dog wouldn't be at the door either. Your dog would turn tail and hide when you come home. And there are some owners that have that kind of a relationship with their dog. It all depends on how you treat them, really. 
And so, in essence, what, what God is saying, and he, he, he spe- uh, specifically uh, uh, mentions this to the fathers. Why? Because we have a tendency to provoke. Men, there's something in us that we, as we talked about uh, last week, or the week before, we were talking about how God has actually placed the husband in leadership in the home. The, the uh, temptation of the woman as a result of the fall is to usurp authority, and the temptation of the man is to rule with an iron fist. And so there's something in us as husbands that we just kind of expect and demand certain behavior. And we can be harsh, and we can be critical, and we can be impatient, and we can do a lot of scolding. But what God has placed us in the family unit to do is to uplift and to encourage and to develop an atmosphere where our kids are looking forward to our coming home. And we're looking forward to being home. And we want to be there. And the result is, is that when we come home and when we've got jobs and things, we've got the right perspective because we realize that at the end of the day, everything else can go upside down in life, but I've got my home. And I've got my family. And I've got my wife. And, and this is the heart of God for every man is that nothing wrong with having a dog. In fact, I'm thinking about getting one. I've been really contemplating it, so really pray for me. I'm in a terrible, terrible decision process of whether to get a dog or not. Um, uh, so there's nothing wrong with having a pet. It's a, it's a beautiful thing, but I think, I really think that our culture, because of our catastrophic failure by and large as a culture in our family life, we, we really are resorting to something that should be delivered by our children and our wife, and we're, 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 we're letting it be replaced by a dog. And again, I love pets. And I think it's great that a dog is so excited to see us come home, even sometimes when we misbehave. And there's something really beautiful. There's a lot of really great illustrations about the heart of a Christian in the midst of that. But men, imagine if your children treated you like your dog treated you. This is getting worse and worse and worse with every passing word that comes out of my mouth. But men, imagine if, you're, if you came home and your kids were just genuinely excited and they put their arms around you and told you how much they loved you and thanks for going to work for us today and really appreciate what you do and how hard you're, you're striving to provide for the family. We admire you. We love you. You're the bomb. You rock, Dad. I mean, men, imagine if that was your homecoming every day coming home from work. Probably wouldn't spend those extra hours you know, at, at the job just to escape coming home. Probably wouldn't spend so much time, you know, doing outside things just so that you didn't have to be in the chaos of your home. Man, this isn't all on your shoulders. Th- this is a family unit effort, and it, and it involves the children. But I want to give you a vision, men, of what God can do in your life. He wants you to be able to come home and be blessed. He wants you to be able to come home. And even if things need to be corrected when you come home, sometimes that happens. In the overall scheme of things, there's a sense of dignity and love and beauty and significance that you experience because you have tended the garden of this family unit in such a way that your kids are blessed that you're their father. That's a calling that God has given us. That's why Paul says, Don't be the kind of man that provokes and damages and harms your children. Instead, he says in the latter part of verse 4, we're to bring them up in the training of the Lord and the admonition of the Lord. Training means to just educate and instruct, and admonition means to correct and rebuke. And uh, it's actually interesting that this word admonition is only mentioned one other time in the New Testament, and it's in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And in that verse, it says that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so, men, God has placed a special responsibility uh, in our purview, in our responsibility, in our hands to to teach our children, to rebuke them when necessary, and then to bring correction after we rebuke them. We're rebuking is telling them what they've done wrong. Correcting is helping them get right back on the path of where, where they need to be going. And training in righteousness is helping them continue to move forward in their walk with God so that they can be a blessing to everyone else and so that you can be experiencing the blessing of having children that are trained in the Lord and so that your family unit can be By and large, it's not always going to be perfect, but by and large, a place of peace. 
a place where, where God rules and reigns and that you and your family and your marriage and your children become a manifold expression of the grace of God in Christ Jesus. When I think about, uh, as I'm teaching this, I'm, and I'm, I'm just thinking about how amazing it would be if every man in here took this on and said, I want to be that kind of a man. If, if every husband here took this role on and said, I want to be that kind of a, of a leader in my home. I want to have that kind of success. I want my kids to truly love me. I want them to be excited when I come home, not just when they're toddlers, but when they're 12 and 13 and 14 and 15. I want, them to, I want to have a good relationship with them. I want, to be, I want to experience what God actually originally intended for my role for you men as a father. And what I want to share with you men is it's good. It's a, it's a blessed thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredible gift that God has given us, but it takes everything that we've got, and I would say more than we've got. I would say, ultimately, you can't do this apart from the power of God. I would say we would need not only everything that we can bring, but everything that God can bring and the Holy Spirit can bring to make us these kind of men because everything in us, but by, by virtue of our fallen nature, mitigates against this kind of life. But men, you are not of this world. You are of the kingdom of God. Men, you aren't citizens of this kingdom. You're citizens of the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Men, you aren't just here on this earth. You're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Men, you aren't just devoid of spiritual content, but you've been filled up by the grace of God. You've been given everything necessary for life and godliness and to carry out this incredible task of being an, a, a great husband and a great father. And God has given this to you. And he knows it's overwhelming, but he, but he allows us to participate in his divine nature. And my, my encouragement to us as men is to step forward. Wherever you are, I don't, maybe you're really struggling. Maybe you've really not done a good job. Maybe you're doing a really good job and you need to fine-tune some things. Wherever you are in that spectrum of options, what I want to encourage you is, by the grace of God, yield yourself to him. And, and say, I want to move forward. I don't even know how to do it. I'm not even sure what to do next. But God, my heart is to be that kind of a man. I want to be that kind of a father. I want to train my children in the love and admonition of Jesus Christ. It needs to be the highest priority above everything else. It needs to supersede our desire for our children's health, for their intellectual brilliance and vigor, for their material prosperity, for their social position, and for their exemption from sorrow and great misfortunes. These are the things that most parents want for their kids. But for us who believe our primary and foremost goal needs to be that they would know God and that they would have a fairly clean version of what that looks like in our lives. And, and men, I've shared this before, but, but 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 should be on the lips of every Christian man in, in the midst of their family. And he says to the church, follow my example as I follow Christ. Your children want that. I, imagine, let's step away just for a moment from our parenting role, especially the men, but the women can kind of uh, jump on board with this as well. But, but imagine for a moment that your parents treated you this way. Imagine that your parents were fair and that they were kind. Imagine that your parents were not hypocritical, but they actually were genuine and authentic in their walk with God. Imagine that your parents were encouraging and inspiring. Imagine that your parents were just edifying and uplifting every time you got around them. Imagine that your parents were proud of you and that your parents followed you even after you left the house and with blessing and with encouragement. Imagine if your parents loved you like that. What would your relationship with your parents be like? Well, you, you can't change what's happened in your past, but you can change what's happening in your present with your own family. And I'll share something else about this, is that some of you are older, and you've, your kids are, you've got grandkids. You've, some of you have great-grandkids. I want to tell you, it's never too late, ever, ever, unless you're dead. It's never too late to change. In fact, I would say it's incumbent upon you to change. And that change requires transformation. It requires confession and repentance. 
and a crying out to God, it sometimes requires making pono with people and saying, I was wrong and you are right, and I want to make this right with you. And so if as adult parents and now your grandparents, if you've got things that you ha didn't handle well, you know, I can't, I can't even begin to tell you how healing it would be for you to simply to go to your children and say so and ask their forgiveness and say, we didn't handle that well. And I thought about it for years and I just didn't want to deal with it and I just don't even know if you remember it, but they, these things bother me. And, and while I'm at it, are there th other things that didn't bother me that bothered you? Because I want to... I want a clean slate. Yeah, you're my 40-year-old son or daughter. Yeah, you're my 50-year-old son or daughter, but I still want to have a good relationship. You know, it's never too late. And the reason I can tell you it's never too late is that what if your parents actually did this with you? Would it make a difference for you if they came and repented and made pono? You bet it would. And if it would make a difference for you, it will make a difference for your kids or grandkids as well. And so the Bible says that we're to be balanced in our parenting. We're not to discipline without love because that's abuse. And we're not to love without discipline because that's permissiveness. Instead, we need to love with discipline and godly parenting. Now, the dividends of that kind of a lifestyle are laid out in Scripture. And they're quite beautiful. As ugly as the, the consequences for a child's misbehavior are laid out in Scripture. The beauty of what happens in a family unit and to a child-parent relationship when a husband in particular, but husband and wife team, actually do what's right in the eyes of the Lord uh, as it relates to their child, it's amazing. The first thing, if we um, are investing in our children, is that we are going to impart wisdom to that child. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 15, the rod of correction imparts wisdom, but a child left to himself disgraces his mother. So the rod of correction... That's not very popular anymore. Um, I'm not going to talk about how to do that today, but I am going to just say that, that there is a place for discipline in the home. And, uh, but it needs to be measured, it needs to be biblical, and it needs to always, always, always be done with the heart of Christ and for the purpose of restoring and bringing about that, that uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 process of teaching, rebuking, training, and correcting and training in righteousness so that that person, that child, can be thoroughly equipped for every good work in Christ. The second benefit is that you're going to establish that child spiritually. Proverbs 22, 6, a, a verse that most uh, parents know, uh, train a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not turn from it. And some of you have invested in your child, and they've turned, and you're still waiting for them to, to turn back. And we'll pray with you for that turning of your child. But there's a promise from God that if we actually invest and train and teach, even if they're wayward for a period of time, that they're going to come back to those principles. The third benefit is that you're going to drive folly out of that child. Do you know that just like there's a, there's a fallen nature in every person, in the husband-wife relationship, we've talked about how the fallen nature in a woman has this tendency to usurp authority. Again, not because she wants to take over, but because she needs a sense of security. And when she doesn't experience that sense of security, she has a tendency to take over and it becomes a problem. The man, on the other hand, has a tendency to dominate and rule with sometimes a not so uh, uh, velvety hand. You know, it's like sometimes it's hard and sometimes it's painful in the sense that the husband's not leading in a godly way. Now we find out that one of the problems of children from the fallen nature is that they have folly bound up in their heart. So they kind of come made that way. Cute as can be, but it doesn't take long before you realize that they don't have to have any friends or any training or watch any TV to start doing the wrong thing. It just comes naturally because the Bible says it's bound up in the heart of a child. So one of the things that happens with the, with the uh, correction of a parent is that we have the privilege of driving that folly out of that person. We're not talking about being abusive, but we're talking about in this this loving, kind relationship of a father in particular leading the way in that family unit and modeling that kind of a life so that the child can respond and receive it. The, the, uh, the other thing that's a benefit is that you're going to save your child's soul. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, 13, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he's not going to die. Punish him with the rod and save his soul from death. The idea is that there's some sort of a punishment that accompanies the training process so that you can keep a child from continuing to make one bad decision after another bad decision after another bad decision that escalates to the point that they actually uh, can actually do great harm to themselves and to other people. And the final benefit is that this 
relationship will fill you with delight. Proverbs 29, 17, discipline your son and he will give you peace and he will bring, bring delight to your soul. I, um, I'm going to close just by kind of summarizing all of this by saying that, that children have a part in this. The idea that if a child is wayward, that it's all the parents' fault, I think is inaccurate. I don't think that's fair because I think sometimes you have really excellent parents who do a really excellent job and they still have a child that goes the wrong way. That's what I love about this scripture. It actually begins with the children's responsibility of doing right in the family unit. And so whether you're a minor and a child or whether you are an adult and still a child of your parents, there is a responsibility that we have. And I want to encourage you to really prayerfully consider going back and making some things right. It's amazing how powerful that is when it comes from the child toward the parent and there is a repentance and a, a making right of things that have not been made right, addressing things that were not handled right on our part in the way that we conducted ourselves. It really hurt our parents. And on the other hand, I think there's a place for especially fathers in this role of parenting to make right with their kids and their spouse if we've mishandled or been too hard or too harsh. You know, I, I'll tell you that... Um, even if you were to start and start doing everything right from this point right now and not make any more mistakes but not making things right in the past that have hurt your child, you're going to be digging out of a hole you may never climb out of. There's very little that will turn the tide faster than you coming and simply saying that I mishandled that situation, I didn't do that right, I was too angry, I was abusive, I neglected you. I demeaned you, I mocked you, I, I, I'm so sorry, and I want to ask you for forgiveness. And I want to repent, which means I don't want to do that anymore. And in some cases, restitution can be very helpful in communicating your commitment to that new life of having a new relationship with your kids. So kind of wrapping up with this whole thing, I, I really believe with all my heart that God has destined the family unit to be one of the greatest blessings that a man or woman can experience as it relates to relational um, blessings on this planet is that he's actually made the family to be a blessing. It's turned into a curse for most people. Most people struggle. Most people have kids that are disobedient and dishonoring. Most parents are frustrated and angry and, and we tolerate each other. And, and, and this becomes the whole fabric of our culture and sometimes even the fabric of the church. And what I want to share with you is I want to lift your eyes up. I want to give you a vision that what God has actually intended, especially for the men here who are fathers, but I would say for the wives as well, is God has actually intended for you to be enormously successful in this arena of life. And he's given us a map in his word of how to be successful in the family relationship. And no matter where you are right now, and no matter how old you are, or what your relationships are, whether you're a father or a grandfather, or whether you're a child in the, in the home of your parents, God has ordained and orchestrated that this is going to be really bad, but your family, your, your family is like coming home to a really happy dog. You know, that sense of well-being, that sense of, man, I just love, the, I just love coming home. I, and you know they're going to be there. You know there's love. You know there's commitment. You know there's respect. You know there's honor. And men, you were made for this. You will never, ever experience this in your workplace like you will at home when the people that know you best respond to you in that way. It's always a, a hollow victory when people that don't really know what you're really like think you're awesome. But when you come home and your family thinks you're awesome and your kids think you're awesome and your wife thinks you're awesome, that is... That's the glory of man. That's the glory of being a husband. That's the glory of being a father. And by virtue of sharing in that glory, you are sharing in the divine nature of Jesus Christ. It's a place that he's appointed for you. It's a place that he's given to you. It's a gift and not a curse. And God wants men, Christian men, valiant men, courageous men, godly men, to step forward into that role and to take on this mantle of leadership. It, it, it feels like Saul's armor on us. We feel like boys. And we put on this, 
this mantle of Jesus Christ, and it's like, I, 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 feel like, I feel like I'm wearing my dad's suit when I was like five years old, you know? I, I don't feel like I'm big enough for this. Well, the truth is we're not big enough for it, but God is more than big enough to help us to grow into this role that God has given us. It's a blessed thing that God's given us in our family. And ladies, for your part in partnership in this, we need all the prayers and all the support and all the encouragement and all the, the edifying that you can do for us. Because this is a place we've never been before. We don't know how to do it uh, very well. We're learning, and we need your encouragement. We need your support. We need you to rally with us, and we need you to come alongside of us and be a partner with us in this adventure that, that stretches us to our very max limits and, and takes us to places that we don't know what to do, and we don't know how to get there, and we don't know what the answers are. And all those things are terribly humiliating for us as men because we want to have answers. We want to fix things. And the biggest problem that we have in our life that we can't quite fix is ourselves. And for that, we need the power of God. And for that, we need your patience and your kindness and support and love and partnership. And those of, the, of the, the, you, you that are children, we need you as our, as our kids to come alongside us too. We need you to rally with us as we work hard at rallying to you and being the men and women and the family units that God has called us to be. And in the midst of all of that, God is glorified and you become an expression of the manifold wisdom of God. And the earth and the nations and this island looks on and they say, is it possible that I could have that too? One of the greatest tools of evangelism on the planet is one of the least utilized. And it's a family that honors God.